Welcome everyone to today's live lesson, the mathematics behind a zombie apocalypse. So today we're gonna to explore, um, uh, we're gonna explore a, a fake zombie virus and we're gonna look and see how it behaves in a, in a, you know, a, a fictitious population. And then uh, with the help of uh, Curtis Brown, we're gonna break down the mathematics behind what's going on. Uh, but a couple of things I wanna uh, cover real quick before I turn it over to, to Curtis. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for being here. We've got a, a big audience uh, from across the country. It's very exciting. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Mr. Cooper's whole squad on the, uh, on the uh, uh, call today. Also, uh, Dr. Shelton's class has joined us and all of the other uh, teachers who are giving their kids extra credit um, or just having their kids tune in. We really appreciate it. and We hope you enjoy this today. Uh, but uh, basically what we wanted to try to do is um, sort of uh, take this situation that we're in with the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, and look at it through a, a slightly different lens, uh, a less serious lens. We're going to use zombies instead of um, coronavirus or flu or any of our other real virus, and we're going to say, okay, what happens if uh, these scenarios take place? With that, I just want to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Curtis Brown, who's going to take it from here, and he's going to break down the mathematics behind uh, a zombie apocalypse. All right, Curtis, are you ready? All right, I think so. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try sharing my screen here. Uh, so let me know when you can see some zombies on screen. I can see them. All right, that's fantastic. Um, I don't know when it's fantastic to see zombies on screen, but uh, I'm sure somebody probably thinks that's a good idea. All right, so Eric, you um, did this last week um, and showed some of the, the science behind uh, viruses and, and kind of um, some of the science that, that students need to understand, in particular with respect to, to this particular virus. So um, I'm going to share a couple of those slides, and then as we go through, we'll We'll get to the mathematics um, pretty quickly, but I, I need for us to have some context. When I taught AP statistics, that was one of my one of my favorite things, um, and one of my favorite uh, sayings was that you know the cool thing about teaching AP statistics and really data modeling in, in general is that you kind of get to play in everybody else's backyard. Um, so you get a little bit of a chance to, to learn a little bit about science or, or about viruses in this case. Um, and so I think it's worth it to, to take a second and check out some, some context. So we're gonna do that. So um, in, this, uh, in this scenario, basically we've got a virus um, that's spreading through, um, through a population. It affects the brains of humans and it turns them into zombies. Um, basically how it does that um, it affects four parts of the brain, the cerebellum, the hypothalamus, the frontal lobe, and the amygdala. Um, and the ways that it affects that are listed here. Um, Eric has talked in depth about this last week, um, about uh, balance and coordination being controlled by the cerebellum, hypothalamus being con uh, controlling the, the appetite. Your frontal lobe kind of gives you the ability to um, do problem solving and make decisions um, and choose. Um, and then your amygdala is kind of where the, the anger and rage um, are, are dealt with in your brain. Um, and so here's a cross section of the brain, kind of giving you some, some areas of the brain to look at. So you've got each of those labeled there. So you can think a little bit about um, those labels and what's happening in those labels as we watch um, our buddy uh, turn into a zombie here in just a second. Um, basically how this particular virus managed uh, or manages uh, the human brain, um, the cerebellum begins to, to shrink a little bit. And you guys will see that just a little bit. Um, so, or sorry, the, the frontal lobe also begins to shrink a little bit. Um, zombies begin to get a little bit clumsy. They, they don't walk very well. Eric had a great video last week of, of showing us some things from uh, some videos about how zombies kind of move. Um, they also have insatiable ap appetite. So you'll see how the hypothalamus changes uh, in just a little bit. And they don't handle things very well. They're not very nice. So when things don't go their way, they kind of get grumpy. Um, and that's, that's hey. the amygdala basically handles this. Hey, Eric, Curtis. A few things going on. Hey, Curtis, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just, just for full disclosure, uh, we need to make sure that the audience is aware that, uh, first off, um, 
nobody was actually hurt in this activity. Second of all, zombies are actually not real. That may be news to some of you folks. I don't know if you're big Walking Dead fans. Some of those zombies seem pretty real. <laughs> I'm a fan, uh, hoping, hoping for a season 10. But, uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the virus we're talking about in all seriousness, it's just a, uh, it's a made up virus. And um, <laughs> we just want to make sure uh, folks realize this is not a real virus. In fact, uh, there's a Harvard professor that helped us write this activity. His name is um, Dr. Steve Schlossman. He is a Harvard Medical School professor, and he wrote a book in which this activity is based upon, and the book is The Zombie Autopsies, Secret Notebooks of the Apocalypse. And it was sort of based on, um, uh, on a, uh, a thing that they were, uh, he was exploring is, hey, if zombies were real, would we blow their heads off or would we try to treat them with uh, medicine? You know, would we try to diagnose them and actually treat them, uh, which is probably a, a better thing to do, especially if you're the zombie. And so um, uh, Dr. Schlossman, before every one of his, his semesters teaching psychiatry to medical school students, he has to, Harvard makes him tell all the students that zombies are not real. <laughs> so so in, in the spirit of Dr. Schlossman, I wanted to make sure we did that as well. So anyway, Curtis, sorry for interrupting you. I just want no, to- No, that's, that's perfect, Eric. I really appreciate that. You know, sometimes I get carried away and just jump into the middle of things. Um, but yes, zombies are not real. However, the parts of the brain that are highlighted in that activity um, are real. And Absolutely. I think it's very worth um, thinking about how those things might uh, might play out. So I just want to give us, I, I want to go quickly through this because I want to give us plenty of time to talk about mathematics and virus spreading and those kinds of things. But just for entertainment purposes, um, at least, uh, we can watch uh, our friend Ryan here turn into... Uh, a zombie. So early infection, if you think a little, a little bit about this, uh, you'll notice that, that something must be happening here uh, in the frontal lobe. Uh, that's probably the first thing you might notice is that um, it started to turn a little bit gray um, and not quite this, the original coloration that we had here. Now, of course, um, that coloration is, is also an artist's rendering. It's not actual true color uh, of this. You can uh, find that out by going to a, a museum of sorts uh, and see those things. Notice now what's beginning to happen. Um, we've got this frontal lobe shrinking here. We've got the, uh, the cerebellum seems to be uh, having some, some effect uh, happening here as well. It's kind of getting uh, messed up just a little bit. I want you to watch these two uh, here as well, the hypothalamus. Uh, and the amygdala. See what's happening in the in the later renditions of this uh, zombie as he's come become completely uh, zombified. Notice the coloration here. We've added some coloration to kind of uh, hype hype that up just a little bit. So just kind of getting you guys thinking about, man, this would not be a good thing, right? We don't really want this virus spreading through a population. We definitely need to to do something about this. We need to think a little bit about. Uh, the mathematics um, and things that might be going on behind the scenes here. So now that we've kind of got some uh, got some background, let's move in and, and talk a little bit about mathematics because I, I want us to be really sure we're, we're doing that uh, in great detail. So um, what we've done now is we've actually looked at this and going through a population and uh, over the first 10 weeks of, of this vi virus outbreak, we've graphed the number of zombies. Um, and the warning here, this graph is pretty scary, probably has a lot more meaning to, to us now than it did maybe originally when we uh, wrote this activity. Um, so thinking about the way that this, this looks on the page, what, what might be scary uh, about this graph? If, if anybody um, can, I'd, I'd love to have your, uh, your comments in the section there. Um, might be interesting to see what you guys think about this being scary. Um, Eric, it's interesting to note that uh, early on, it doesn't look like a whole lot is going on, right? Um, and we've all kind of lived this, actually, that early on, it doesn't look like a whole lot's going on. And then by week, uh, week eight, we've got 6,500 cases. By week nine, we've got 19,000 cases. And by week 10, we're up almost to 60,000 cases. Things are happening really, really quickly. Um, and this is a graph that most of you guys probably can recognize and, and can name it uh, as an exponential curve, right? 
And I noticed a couple of people noted some things that it increases tremendously over, um, especially after the sixth week. Um, so basically I've got a couple of questions for you. One might be, when was the greatest rate of change? It's definitely increasing, but where is the rate of change of number of zombies increasing the most rapid in this graph between which two weeks? And then secondly, I might ask, okay, now that you've kind of thought about that, what do you think about um, maybe the average rate of change or the rate of change of infection from week one to week 10? Is there anything that we could talk about um, maybe is that a good approximation for what's going to continue to happen? Um, or what do you, what do you think? So I want you guys to kind of think about those kinds of things, uh, happening there. I see a couple of people, uh, commenting on this. There was a dramatic increase, 15,000 to 60,000. Um, I also see that somebody said, Hey, it's exponential. Well, let's talk about exponential. Eric, can you tell me just a little bit about what you noticed about the number here from seven, uh, the week seven to week eight. We've got 2,196, 6,588. What does that look like to you? Yeah, it's a it's an increase of a little over 4,000. It, it, it almost looks like it's tripling. I think we could probably get a better guess at, at whether or not it's tripling if we slide down here just a little bit. So look, notice the value in each week, three, nine, 27 it does in fact look like exactly like we're tripling every single week. So every single week, it looks like we are tripling, which is crazy. Um, I did see that somebody's commented about the average rate of change between week one and week 10. I want to know if anybody thinks that that will continue. Maybe that, uh, that could continue. So this graph is kind of scary because of the picture that it, that it paints, right? In 10 weeks, we jumped from virtually no uh, cases of zombie virus, which is not real. I'm going to make sure that I say that again. Uh, up to about 60,000 cases by week 10, um, which is insane. Now, if I had started with this picture, would you guys have been scared? Would you find it as scary? Well, it looks pretty scary. In fact, it looks basically like the graph that we just saw a moment ago, only what's a little bit different. Well, we should note that uh, by week six, it seems like the dr dramatic increase. We've got this nothing really happening in week one and week two, but now looks like in week three and four, things are starting to happen and oh, but wait a minute. I changed the scale on you. So scale matters. And this is one of the things that I wanna make sure that I talk about in this presentation that, you know, I'm gonna be showing some data here in just a little bit that's real data. Um, and scale matters. Scale matters tremendously when we start to look at representations of data. So that picture that we painted earlier on about us jumping from week one to week 10 and going up uh, to almost 60,000 by week 10, and we saw this here and it looked really scary. Um, somebody just said it's less scary because it's smaller numbers. I agree, the smaller numbers are definitely less scary. However, um, what's happening is not less scary, right? We have that same exponential growth happening. And the only reason they looked a little bit different was the scale. So I want to make sure that we point that, point that out and we kind of get that conversation happening there. Yeah. Now the next question. Um, and Sria uh, called this out, Eric. She said, hey, I can't wait to see what happens in week 100. Well, that's an interesting scenario. That would be an interesting scenario. If we continued tripling to week 100, how many zombies would there be? Would there be more zombies than there are on the earth? Would there be enough people? I'm not sure. To make it to week 100. Interesting question. So zombies, if they continued eating this, and we, let's take Saria's um, um, scenario there and going out to 100. If we t continue tripling out to 100, that's basically raising three to the 100th power. I believe very strongly that there are not that many people on the earth. Uh, in fact, I think if you type that into your calculator, you may get an error message. Um, I haven't tried it, but um, try that and see if, see if you can figure that out. 
So we might have a problem thinking about the 100th week if we continue to think that this is going to keep going. In fact, that leads us to the next piece. Thank you for, um, Suri is not a plant, by the way. Um, that was a true comment. So let's think about this for just a second. Eric, we've got this uh, really cool uh, simulation that you created um, or had somebody create um, that shows us the number of humans and zombies. So we've got this little population of 16,200 uh, 16, uh, humans and 600 zombies um, for what, a total of 16,800 uh, total people in the population here, uh, represented by these dots. Okay, and we're gonna take we're gonna take this over time. We're gonna watch this uh, this zombie virus spread through the population in this simulation here. Now, a couple of things that are gonna control this. Um, the first one uh, is this this idea of virulence. Okay, so we're gonna look at this idea of virulence. And virulence, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but virulence is basically how easily a virus spreads through a population. It's not necessarily the, how rapid it does because that's also affected by other things, but it's how easily a virus would spread through a population. Is that correct? Yeah, that's basically it. It's, it's, it's basically the measure of how, how, um, how a disease causing pathogen like a virus can, can uh, infect you know, a population. So it's okay. Okay. Really for things that, that, are, that, are, that are disease causing, you know, not all viruses cause disease, but in this case, the zombie one, they do. Sure, sure. Okay, so, so that's kind of the, the, the concept. It's how quick, how easily this thing might uh, spread through a population. Um, and we'll talk about the rate, the speed at which things spread through a population in just a moment and how we can, how we can infect that. But um, watch this for just a second and see, oh, there we go. I, somebody did while we're watching that. Somebody yeah. raised the 100th <laughs> power. Um, and that's 5.1 times 10 to the 47th uh, power. So a lot of zeros. That's a lot of zeros. We do not have uh, that many. Uh, we do not have that many people on the earth. Um, so that would be a problem. And that's exactly what begins to happen here. So check this out. <laughs> Earlier you said four, uh, what I, happened? I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Earlier you you mentioned that uh, Sharia is not a plant. And uh, somebody in the in the comment said, uh, "That's correct. She is my prized geometry student." That's fabulous. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> it was like Mr. Kramer. So, Mr. Kramer. That's, that's seriously cool. That's, that's really funny. <laughs> so, so this did exactly actually what we would hope it would do. Um, so we had that scary, um, that really scary kind of uh, curve at the beginning here, and I'm going to try to adjust my my window here. Here we go want to stretch this out. So if we look at just the beginning, say six weeks of this, what do you notice? Looks exponential, right? Everything looks really exponential. It's what we kind of expected uh, to happen at the very first uh, little chunk of this. But then as it continued to grow, what happens between week six and say week nine or 10? How would you describe that part of the graph? Anybody um, out there want to talk about um, maybe how you might describe the rate of change or, or even maybe um, what this portion of the graph looks like, ignoring the front half, but this front uh, little, little section here. The front little section here, this is kind of interesting. Uh, it looks like, and I'm gonna wait, you guys can, can, uh, can comment on that. Um, Eric, what do you think? What does it look like here? Yeah, I mean, it it, uh, it looks like a pretty consistent rate, actually. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a real constant rate, right? So we've got this, it, it, it's got this really constant rate right here between, say, week six and, I don't know, week nine or ten. It looks like it's fairly consistent, uh, that little chunk there. It's almost linear, if you will. Yeah. You want to talk about that between week six and, and say, uh, week nine, ten, eleven. Uh, it looks fairly linear. But then as we continue to scrunch this down, I saw somebody post just now, Robert Jackson said, hey, it, it, it approaches a limit. Um, and that's exactly right. So once we hit about week 12 or 13, that, that, linear, that linear chunk, that part that, set, that sort of looks linear, um, sort of tapers off. And now we kind of get back to this uh, more curved nature and it almost looks like it slows down. 
And the idea of approaching a limit um, is exactly what we're getting at. Um, our pre-calculus teachers might uh, talk to, to our students a little bit about um, approaching, approaching a limit. And that means that, you know, we're not actually going to quite get there, but we're getting really, really, really close. As time continues to go on, we're getting more and more zombies, but getting close to that population limit since we can't exceed it. We can't get more uh, of that, which is really cool. So um, we're going to talk now just a little bit about uh, this, this idea. So let's uh, reset this. Let's reset this thing. Hey, Curtis, uh, while you're um, resetting that, I think you just have to grab that black bar and pull that. I think I do too. Over up. Um, what's going on with the white squares? How come there aren't any um, any uh, white squares? Oh, so let's talk. Let's think a little bit about those white squares there, just a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to have to really do a lot of Control Z's to get that back. There we go. Now I'm good. All right, so let's talk about those little white squares. So those little white squares um, happened because people around those areas didn't get infected with the virus. So that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, when you look at a virus um, and, and a disease as it, as it goes through the population, there's actually almost a, a probability, and I'm not gonna use the right terminology, so Eric, you can be the science teacher and correct me here, but effectively, um, every time I'm exposed to someone with the virus, um, I'm not automatically going to get it. There are a lot of things that kind of go into to contributing factors that go into that, the amount of time I was exposed, how much of the virus came into my body, whether my body's already resistant to that, to that virus. There's a lot of different things that, that um, could, um, could go into that. And man, I'm having a hard time grabbing that little box. There we yeah. go. Um, now I've got it. So there's a lot of things that go into that, but what can happen is you can almost get isolated right from the zombies. Um, and, and that virus then can't come in and, and get to you because everyone around you has already had it um, and then built up immunities. Is that effectively what that, those white squares were about? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a subject to interpretation, but I think you hit all the possibilities there, you know, sort of a, a natural immunity, um, it, you know, it's possible that, that those particular humans were uh, isolated, you know, they were already kind of quarantined and, uh, and not exposed to the virus. So, you know, it, it, it kind of represents reality, actually, because uh, even though a disease caused an agent may go through a population, it's unlikely that it's going to be able to wipe out every single person. You know, a lot of people, you know, the plague, when the plague went through Europe, it, it wiped out about a third of the population, which was obviously devastating. Um, but it didn't kill everybody. As devastating as it was, you know, two thirds of the European population survived, lived on, and, and had immunity. Um, so, yeah, disease causing agents are interesting. Absolutely, that's right. Interesting that's graph. right. So, um, so just looking at this, we just ran this a second time with virulence two instead of virulence four. And what do you notice this time? The curve itself is a little bit more spread out. That linear section that we talked about um, kind of at the, at the beginning when we were looking at say um, week six to week uh, 12 is actually now a little, bit, um, a little bit shifted and a little bit more spread out um, from what we had before. So we've slowed the virus down. So this term virulence, um, this term virulence is actually how, how quickly now that we can model it with how quickly the virus is, is spreading. And so if we had a really high virulence, this thing is gonna go through the population super fast. If we had a virulence that was slightly slower, um, the, viril the uh, amount of time it takes to go through the virus is, uh, through the population is much, much smaller, right? So there's a couple of, man, I'm having some issues there. There we go. So now you can see the difference between virulence 10. Notice how much faster this thing went through that linear section. So we went from, almost nobody to a whole bunch of people in virtually no time at all. So virulence definitely talking about how contagious uh, this thing is. Now I'm gonna, I need to reset that. So that I want a better curve than what we had just a minute ago. So let's go back to virulence four. I'm gonna let that play out, but this time we're gonna watch it from, from this graph. So while we're watching this from this graph, I want you to think about um, what you notice or what's interesting uh, about this particular graph 
um, that's maybe the same as the graph we had just a moment ago. And then what are we noticing um, about these blue squares uh, in that section of the graph? So what we've kind of got here um, is a graph now of both sections of the population a little bit. So, um, so Eric, what do you think about the, the relationship maybe that we can show or we can talk about um, with the humans and the, and the zombie, the number of zombies? Notice what we've got going on here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really interesting graph. So humans are decreasing at about the same rate at the same time as the zombies are increasing. These, these graphs almost look like a reflection of one another. They are, in fact, a reflection of one another. If we think a little bit about the population itself, um, we've actually got every single pair of these dots is going to add up to the exact same number, right? We think about that. There's only two options. You can be a human or you can be a zombie. That's it. There's no other, uh, no other possibilities in here. And so um, what we do have is, is really this nice relationship between uh, this, this curve here um, that models the number of zombies over time and the relationship with the number of, of humans over time. Now, there's this Curtis, really interesting have, point. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I have a lot of uh, great um, comments in the chat. Uh, it looks like uh, several people have noticed that the, um, the two graphs intersect and mm. they're saying they're, they're basically equivalent numbers at week seven. Uh, yes. Our student mentioned that uh, the human population has a negative slope while the zombie population has a positive slope. That's uh, exactly right. So we noticed that the human population is decreasing over time. And we kind of talked about that uh, a moment ago that, you know, if the zombies continued to go all the way through, they would take out the entire population, right? And so there was, there is this relationship that as the number of zombies increase, the number of humans uh, decrease, which is totally Totally true. So we definitely have a negative slope here, a negative relationship uh, between these two. Now, the ones that the people that pointed out this this section uh, about week number seven, um, about week number seven, this is going to be an important week here in just a moment. Um, that place where the two graphs intersect and they virtually have the exact same number of, of, of people in each of those two groups, humans and zombies. Um, that's an important week because what that is, is we're going to get to, it's, it's going to be called what we're going to call the inflection point. All right. So this first little chunk of, of the graph really does basically follow uh, a linear or sorry, not a linear, an exponential growth curve. This little first little section of the graph, it follows virtually a, an exponential curve. And then long about long right in here, it starts to turn uh, a little bit. And in fact, right here at week seven is going to be where the number of zombies each week actually begins to decrease over time. So let's look at these data points uh, and we're gonna look at it a little more visually here in just a second, but I can hover and show you what we're talking about. So let's look at the, at the number of zombies here um, between let's say week three and week four. Some nice, nice easy numbers to look at. So I have 2,300, um, and then I have 3,325. So that's, uh, what is that, 1,025 uh, 1, increase right here. And then between week five and week six, I've got a, a significantly larger number uh, of zombies um, in that week that increased, right? And then between six and seven, I'm going from 6,200, uh, 6, 225. Um, to 7,125, so that's like 900 zombies, all right? So I jumped up, uh, jumped up more than 1,000 here, and I jumped up less than 1,000 here, and then I jumped up less than 1,000 uh, here. No, a little bit more than 1,000 there. So we had, ooh, this is not linear, not uh, constant. That's interesting. All right, so right along in here is where that's going to change from increasing more rapidly to increasing at a less rapid rate. And that's what we're gonna talk about as an inflection point. Now, that's gonna be much more interesting if we take this and look at the rate of change of zombies. So let's talk about the rate of change of zombies from week to week. So 
if they can comment, if students can comment in the in this uh, in this comment section, I'd love to hear what do you guys talk about in the first say six weeks on this graph? What can you guys say about the number of zombies each week? Is it increasing, or is the number of zombies each week so the rate of zombies each week decreasing, increasing, decreasing, or about the same? I'm gonna give you guys just a second to answer that one because I think that's kind of an interesting discussion. Eric, what do you think? Increasing, decreasing, stays the same. Yeah, so your question was about the rate, right? Not the, the rate. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are obviously increasing. Um, okay. So between weeks one and six. And to me, it looks like maybe both the, num the numbers or the rate is, it looks like the rate might be increasing part of that. And then it starts to, oh no, it looks like it's increasing all the way. So thinking about this, just from the visual, it looks like, and I agree with you, Eric, that it's increasing. I saw Kennedy point out increasing. Several people have pointed out that it's increasing. Now let's talk about the second half. Let's talk about from week seven, to week 12 or 13. Is this, is the number of zombies or the rate of zombies each week increasing or decreasing from week seven on up to week 15 here? Well, it looks like it's decreasing on this side. Now that's gonna be a lot more visually apparent. Let's play with this. Let's play with that picture just a second here. So right. Curtis, so, so even though the numbers are still going up, right? The rate of change isn't. The rate exactly is is not going up. Right. So the number of zombies each week is still going up in this picture, but the rate of zombies, the number of zombies per week, is going down. So I noticed somebody pointed out, hey, we've got this positive concavity here, which means that we're increasing at an increasing rate. So that's positive concavity. And then if we look at from week seven on to week 15, we've got negative concavity, which means that we are increasing in number, but at a decreasing rate, increasing at a decreasing rate. Now let's talk about this picture. I've actually pulled up a picture of the zombie rates uh, over the course of time. So what I did was I actually went in and collected the data and subtracted um, each week from the previous and got the difference and then plotted that as the zombie rate. So let's look at this at this picture. Notice we've kind of at early on we had this increase of zombies and then uh, a gradual decrease of zombies. Now this is at random, so we did have one week that threw me off. That's why I made a mistake earlier talking about this. But uh, we've got this data that kind of increases and then decreases. Now I've thrown a little curve here uh, on this and um, let's talk about, so what week did it, did it go, Eric? Do you remember? You said it was week. Uh, for, right? oh, but uh, yeah, at the uh, sort of that intersection. That intersection happened at week seven. So notice where the peak is in this data. It's also at week number seven, isn't it? Which is yeah. Thing. I think that's kind of cool that we can actually talk a little bit about this and see. Let's see. I was trying to skinny this thing up here just a little bit. I wanted to uh, give us some some idea of a curve that might fit that. That looks a little bit better. So we've kind of got a little curve here. I could continue to mess with the numbers just a little bit and we could figure that out. But I wanted to point out that that peak that happens in the daily rate or the weekly rate uh, of zombies is at the same point where we talk about the change in concavity. And we talk about that point being called the inflection point, right? So that's kind of a cool, kind of a cool way we can talk about this. And, and really, this is a really nice model. I noticed somebody comment about this earlier that this really is increasing logistically. And we're not gonna go through and talk about the logistics curve and trying to find all of the, the ways we could model this data with a logistic curve, because 
Um, that's, I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we wanted to talk about today. But I did want to point out, um, looking at this daily or weekly rate is very important. Now, the reason I keep saying daily rate is because I have been talking uh, about um, this COVID data and, and being able to look at the current situation, looking at real data where, um, where we all are right now, thinking uh, about this from, from, okay, we've played with zombies to understand basically how this thing models or goes through a population. Now let's see how this has played out in real life. Because Eric, when you guys created this sim, we really kind of just played with probability of spreading, right? So that was kind of our idea of virulence. Um, but we basically assumed that everybody was going to be in kind of this one space that um, everybody had the probability or possibility of being exposed. We didn't have quarantine measurements put in yeah. or any of that kind of stuff, right? No, that's this right. This is yeah, basically like life, what might have happened if all of us just continued life as normal. Right. Yeah, the funny thing is, is this activity was written in 2014, 2015 timeframe. Right. Obviously, uh, many, many years before uh, the COVID. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the model in general sort of applies to a lot of these these pathogens that move through a population. Um, it just so happens that uh, some of the COVID data also matches up with with sort of this general curve just because it's just the nature of how these things work. Yep. It certainly is. So um, I spoiled it there just a moment ago. Hopefully nobody was paying too much attention to my screen and they were listening to you talk uh, instead of looking at my screen. Um, but what I've done here is I've gone to the CDC and the WHO, not the band, but the, the World Health Organization. I've collected some, um, some data on uh, the number of uh, cases of COVID. Um, based on the number of days in 2020. So on January 1st, 2020, this is kind of the data that was, um, that was recorded and, and on those pages. And so I just wanted to kind of give us all a basis for what we're, what we're about to look at, what we're about to talk about uh, and think, think a little bit about. So we're looking at the, the, the data for Australia and the United States. Right, we're going to look at Australia and the United States. Before I get here, Eric, were there any other questions uh, related to that zombie data that I didn't see earlier? Well, it was a nice, uh, just some comments. I mean, it was a really nice uh, visual visual to, to see that, uh, you know, Sharia uh, commented that the vertex of the parabola was at week seven, and she's ah, correct. Yeah, so you yeah. could, you could, yeah, the vertex of this, this almost looks parabolic in shape, right? And the vertex, yeah, sure, certainly could have been uh, lifted right here at week seven. Um, and we could probably model that really nicely with a quadratic as well. Um, which I just think it was a neat representation to, to, to show that, hey, you know, um, uh, the rate of change and the actual numbers of people being infected, those are two different things, obviously related to one another. But uh, even though the number of people that were being infected is still going up, it's a positive sign that the rate was decreasing. Uh, that, that's a good thing. So people are still- that sure is. Just not at that same rate. Let me shift that over. So because our graph was almost perfectly symmetric, uh, they added, that inflection point actually technically happens um, halfway between week seven and week eight, just because of the way that our data was shaped. Um, but yeah, ex that's exactly it. Like looking at this gives us some perspective or some hope about the kinds of things we can pay attention to um, each week and, and give us some idea as to what part of the curve we're actually, uh, we're actually in. So hey, somebody uh, did, said, shouldn't the amount of zombies change yes. the population because zombies die eventually or need to eat humans to survive? So Eric, yeah. It's awesome. This person's bringing up, uh, Stephen's bringing up the idea of predator prey kind of concept there, right? That, you know, ultimately you do run out of humans to eat or, you know, a virus runs out of new humans to infect because they right. they're gotten, uh, you know, immune to the virus or they've been vaccinated or um, yep. the virus itself mm -hmm. dies out. And depending on which uh, zombie movie or TV show or comic book you're into, um, uh, will change the outcome. 
So, <laughs> so uh, some zombies uh, become zombies, not from a zombie bite, but they become, zomb become zombies from some sort of uh, uh, mysterious pathogen that infects a lot of the population, but not everybody. Uh, uh, um, some, some zombie movies portray zombies, hey, they bite this person, that person turns into a zombie. Clearly they didn't taste that great because the zombie didn't keep eating them. And so they go off and eat somebody else that tastes better, I guess. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know. So clearly, clearly this zombie idea, while it was cool in general to get people's interest up, uh, it, it doesn't model what's really happening in real life. Uh, yeah. As far as I know, I don't know of any actual real life pathogens that make people want to eat other people, which is good. So I'm hoping that stays the same. I don't. I don't want to. Uh, um, I don't see oh. that. I mean, to to their point though, uh, if you made the assumption that uh, um, zombies rely on humans in two different ways: one, to infect them to become you know part of the the zombie horde, and two, for food, then that would decrease the population of humans even faster, right? Right. It would increase the the rate of zombification, so to speak, um, a little bit faster too. But those two charts may not be reflections of one another. So it depends on you know, which zombie um, narrative you're you're going with. But that's a yeah. real question. That's a neat question. I, we got another nice, interesting question here, and I'm going to get to it, Ethan. Which ah. is there be a variable for fatal cases or maybe for cured cases coming back? What if there's a cure for the zombie and a, a zombie could turn back to human? Um, so, oh, I can talk a little bit about um, why I chose a normal curve instead of the quadratic original. Um, that's a really good question, Daniel. I, I appreciate that question. So I chose uh, the model uh, for a normal curve because if I look at the logistic curve, so let's go back to um, a logistic curve, just a minute. So if I went in here, and in fact I can I can do this because it's uh, already there. I wasn't going to, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the cuff. Just oh, you know what? They don't have the same domain, so can't can't do that. All right. So um, if I look at this picture of the red uh, of these red data points, we notice it to be a logistic curve, right? You that that part a lot of people are comfortable with and the idea of it. The reason I chose the normal curve is because I was trying to think of a curve that, um, that models this same sort of variability. So a normal curve, if I'm going to talk about the rate of change of zombies, the weekly change uh, of zombies, I've got, uh, I've got a very small weekly change. In fact, almost no weekly change out here between zero and one, right? And then from week one to week two, I've got a relatively small amount of change and then it continues to grow. And then at some peak here between uh, six, seven and eight, there's a really, that's the peak rate of change. And then the same thing happens on the other side. My rate of change of zombies begins to decrease, but it doesn't decrease, um, really rapid, it doesn't become linear, and it doesn't, it doesn't completely go off um, to completely flat. I've got this kind of uh, slowing down, approaching a limit, but not ever really getting to zero kind of concept here. Um, and so the, I, the reason I chose the normal curve is because it really does uh, model that, that derivative of, whoops, that derivative of the logistics curve. And if you wanted me to get to the idea of it being the calculus derivative of the logistic curve being the normal curve, um, that's, that's effectively where I pulled that from. That's why I, I pulled it up. Um, why is it represented as a curve and not represented as a slope, as a quadratic whose slope is negative? Well, that was so I could get this, uh, this little tails on the end. If we change the, uh, the virulence, and I'm getting a little off track here, but that's okay. Um, we change the virulence uh, on this zombie curve. Let's reset it and do the zombie curve at a virulence uh, that's much lower. You'll see what I'm kind of getting at um, as we build this, this curve down here. Uh, I'm gonna have to shrink this down though so that it scales. Um, so 
that we'll get what we kind of want. But I'm going to pause real quick. So this is probably going to be more like about week 20. So this is going to be like two. And then this is going to be like week 20. And then we're going to get this picture. So notice what we have this time. We had a much less uh, we had a much less nice curve actually this time, but oops, it didn't happen at week twenty. It happened about week eighteen. Okay, there we go. Let's put that in there. All right. So notice what happened this time. We had a really um, kind of a small rate of change here at the very beginning. Then it gradually increased and then it gradually decreased. But we don't go to the uh, quadratic form that uh, goes completely um, linear because think about the quadratic, it would continue going further and further. And what I want this rate of change to do is actually approach zero uh, over time. Uh, and so that's why I chose the normal curve instead of a parabola. All right, so let's get to this US data. Let's talk, um, kind of get ourselves back into off of zombies. I know, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take us away from zombie uh, land for just a minute and bring us to, to um, the world in which we're living right now. So, hey Curtis, but before you move different. from zombies, you know, yeah. they live forever. But uh, I, we had a question about, uh, hey, well, what about, uh, you know, can the zombies turn back into humans? And, and listen, in make believe land, we can make anything happen. And that's why we wrote Zombie Apocalypse Part Two, The Human Strike Back. And I'm not even joking, that's a real activity. It's on our website at uh, www.stemhollywood.com. <laughs> and uh, we, we go through uh, some biology and chemistry of um, uh, uh, acidosis and alkalosis and, and what that does to the body. And we come up with a, uh, a fake cure for a fake disease um, to turn all the uh, fake zombies into uh, fake humans. So I just wanted to make that known so everybody everybody knew that was out there and available. So that's not a fake lesson. No, the lesson's very real. <laughs> <laughs> lesson dealing with human zombies, cures, and diseases is fake. But the, sci the science is pretty cool. <laughs> that's awesome. That's fantastic. All right. All right. Let's look at a picture, man, I did it again. Let's look at a picture of um, the US data that we have uh, this, this here, this connection. So remember early on when I was talking to us about the, uh, the picture of that zombie data, and I was having us look very carefully um, at the section of data where, you know, we had this exponential growth section, and then we have this, this time period where it looks like it's relatively uh, linear and look at the data. This is the United States data updated to about yesterday or maybe two days ago. Um, and and look at look at what we have. If we break this off at say let's let's say it starts about 88, about the 88th day or 87th day of the year, um, and then take it all the way up here to where we are now at 138 days, we pretty much have. I mean, if I was I was looking at that, I would say that looked like a pretty linear chunk uh, of data. So this gives us an idea, an idea of where we might be in the curve uh, of, of what's happening with our data. Now, we have two things though that have played into this, all right? Before we were just letting things go at random, flying through, right? So that was the zombie data, that was what was going on. Now here in real life, we have actually implemented some things that have actually impacted this curve dramatically so that it, it has shifted away from what we would have expected uh, from a true logistic curve, all right? So that's, that's really a good thing um, to see, but I wanted to kind of point this out. Now, we're gonna get to, uh, we're gonna get to what that looks like in the daily rates here in just a second, but I wanted to show another country um, on a different scale you guys can recognize this, AUS, it's Australia. Notice what happened in Australia. They had exactly what we might have expected to happen uh, in their COVID outbreak uh, and recovery. 
which is pretty incredible to see this really nice, beautiful logistic curve. And I would highly encourage you guys, if you um, are interested in data and going out and checking these things out, there's plenty of websites out there with data that you can go and dig and, and make plots and, and kind of experiment and look around. Um, it's very interesting um, data to check out what's been happening in the different countries around the world um, regarding this. But this is one of the more interesting ones that Australia really ended up having exactly what we would have expected with uh, this really nice logistic curve. Now, let's talk about rates. So if we go back and we look at this, uh, this curve, I'm gonna look at the US daily rate, which is really kind of a cool uh, picture here. Notice what has happened. We had um, kind of the increase like we would have expected from that normal curve. We had virtually zero down here at the front and then uh, a, a nice a rapid increase here. And then it kind of tapered off. But now notice what we've got here. Because of the uh, constraints that we've made here, um, we've actually managed to change how this curve actually looks based upon some of the, uh, the things that we're doing um, to try to stay safe, which is really kind of cool. But notice where we are in the curve, exactly what we expected, right? We looked at the picture um, over here on page 1.2. We had that linear chunk. Where are we at? We have that linear chunk, which is really kind of cool. I noticed we've got several different uh, things here. Due to the lower population of Australia, maybe the spread outness of, of Australia, I think there's lots of things um, that are really, uh, really kind of interesting. But this is the one that gives me some, some interesting thought around what's going on here in the United States, that we're seeing this gradual taper, tapering off of the US daily rate, which is really kind of cool. What is this ball of dots? I'm interesting, interested in the ball of dots. Well, let's spread this ball of dots out just a little bit, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ignore the first uh, 80 or 100 days. So if we, if we look at this now, this is what the US data is kind of doing right now. So now you can kind of look at this pattern for the last uh, 35, 40 days. We've got this very slight negative trend across the United States daily data um, that seems to be happening, which is really kind of cool, right? That means we have departed a little bit from that logistics curve, which is really kind of, uh, kind of a good thing. Um, I'm not going to make any projections because I would be speaking way out of turn. Um, but this is interesting. This is what the pictures show, which is really kind of cool. So what do you expect that Australia, uh, that Australia chunk to look at? That Australia chunk, that Australia set of data looks very interesting on this page. It does exactly what we would have expected. We had that really nice a uh, relatively normal curve. We had virtually no um, new COVID cases early on. Um, the rate of change was very small, zero or one for, bulk, for the bulk of the first 60 days. And then we kind of have this peak and then it slows back down and does this uh, normal curve. So this maybe gives a little bit better picture as to why I chose a normal curve on that other zombie graph. Um, because uh, of, of what's happening here. I want that limit to approach uh, zero in both sides uh, as we get out towards uh, the edges. And then I need this nice swell in the middle, which is where the normal curve kind of came, came about, which is, uh, which is why I kind of used that earlier on. Before we wrap up, because I know we've got about um, five minutes left to go here. Um, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to go ahead and give you one more simulation this is a simulation that um, was built by one of our coworkers. Uh, I've got a version of it here. There's actually a version of it that's uh, posted on our website underneath of a blog that we talked about. Um, so that's gonna be put out into the chat here in just a second. Um, but I wanted to show you guys just really quickly um, what we're talking about when people talk about this flattening of the curve. You've seen it kind of in data here um, both in Australia and maybe more dramatically in the United States, flattening out the curve of daily rates. But now let's talk about what that looks like, um, what that looks like in kind of a, a, another simulation. So here's, here's a simulation, we'll run, it, we'll run it relatively fast. We're gonna make this thing spread like wildfire, all right? So I'm gonna increase um, this R value 
um, which is effectively kind of like what we talked about with virulence. It's not the same thing, but it's very, uh, it's, it's similar and it, it affects the, the probability or the rate of spread uh, through a population. So I'm gonna let this thing fire and you guys are watching for the red dots. If you guys watch for those red dots, you'll see this, uh, this virus spread pretty quickly through a population of people mixing freely. Looks like we have, uh, after 12 days, we have nobody that was uninfected. Um, and now we're beginning to see the number of people recovered. I'm gonna go ahead and let this play out for just uh, a minute. Yeah, I know I've got negative uninfected people, but that's all right. What I'm mostly interested in is uh, the, re uh, the recovered group. So now what I've got here is I've got this, uh, this really nice red curve that shows, whoops, there we go, that's what I wanted. I'm gonna pause that thing, there we go. All right, so what I wanted to share was this departure from the overall population to, to the number of recorded um, sick people. Now, let's go to what happens if, let's say we keep our, uh, our circle of people that we influence smaller. So let's say that, that we start to quarantine. Maybe I pull myself into my, uh, into my, popu into my own personal population there. Um, so this is maybe my circle of people that I affect, all right? Now let's talk about how that quarantine can kind of impact, uh, impact the, the spread of this virus. So let's watch these red dots spread um, in this particular one. Oops, I had a couple escape. But you'll notice, even though we're getting this large number of people getting infected here, I'm gonna pause it after about 20 days. Notice the difference Notice the difference in the curves. So we still match the, the population of, uh, overall, but then we had this really dramatic decrease um, because people were able to start recovering faster than, they, than we had uh, people getting infected. You wanna watch that one more time? Let's check out that imp impact of, of quarantine. Notice that we've only got this one little space where people can escape which is kind of the idea, right? You don't wanna be out in, pop, in public uh, going around doing some of these things. You kind of get the idea that, man, I could start to get a few people recovering, but if one person escapes, what happens over here? Notice what happened. We had that departure from that logistic curve that we would have expected before. So that quarantine does in fact uh, impact this uh, over time and it does impact that uh, the spread. And just like Isaiah noticed and some of these other people, um, it does impact the, the rate of spread. It slows things down to kind of keep yourself in quarantine. So that's what the idea is behind quarantine. That's why uh, we talk about it. That's why you've heard people talking about it. That's why um, it started to happen. Notice I got one person that fell out that time in my simulation and started to get through. Um, and now we'll see this simulation kind of the impact of that uh, on that. So you can see these curves departing dramatically from what we expected with that uh, exponential curve uh, early on. Does that sound satisfying? Eric, any other comments that we've got? Uh, just uh, uh, I, like you said, Isaiah, notice that it slows it down. Um, there's a big difference from uh, one scenario to the next. And um, Great presentation. Simulations are really useful. So, so it looks like uh, folks uh, enjoyed the uh, uh, the use of the simulations to kind of model what's happening with fake zombies, and then how that applies to like real life uh, COVID issues that we're all dealing with right now. All right, very cool. Well, I don't know that I have a whole lot more uh, to demonstrate or to show in this. Uh, we don't have any more uh, questions. Uh, I think we're I think we're probably good to wrap up. So Eric, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. I just want to say thank you to all the students and teachers that that tuned in. We appreciate this. We hope you find it useful. Um, and and a shameless plug, we're doing another one of these uh, this Thursday on uh, on a on an activity called Body of Evidence, which is exploring uh, the use of maggots, flies, and and decomposing flesh. 
uh, to figure out the identity of, of, uh, of a uh, body that's found in a field. So if you're into forensic science um, or you know just mystery, uh, it's a really cool mystery related kind of activity. Uh, there are four possible missing persons that you have to try to identify. So throughout the activity, we'll be giving you clues. There's text that you'll see on the screen that you'll need to pay attention to. And then at the end, we'll ask to, uh, uh, to find out who thinks the, who the, the body of the missing person belongs to. So it's kind of cool. Uh, and uh, so, so anyway, don't forget, uh, for those of you that want to see the humans or the zombies get healed and become humans, <laughs> uh, we can make that possible. Just go to our website. I think uh, our colleague posted the link to the uh, zombies part two, the human strike back, and you'll be able to see that. Uh, but with that, with that, I think that's it for us. And thanks again for everybody um, attending and, and hope you enjoyed it and uh, look forward to hearing from you on Thursday. Bye. <laughs> oh, I forgot to show my shirt for anybody that's watching. I'll show my shirt real quick. Hopefully you can see it. Can you see that, Curtis? I can see it. If zombies attack us, I'm tripping you. Wait a minute. I don't like yeah. No, that's how you deal with zombies. You find someone who's slower than you, and then if they uh, <laughs> attack you, then you just push them in, in the way of the zombies. That's how that works. There you go.